We now move to questions to the Education Minister. Question number one, Lord Morrow's not in his place. Dahi Mackay, Mr Mackay. Question number two. During the 2014-15 financial year, the following minor, minor capital work schemes are planned and have been given approval in principle to proceed for St Louis Grammar School, Balamina. Replacement of four mobile classrooms with two double modular classrooms and a basic refurbishment of the canteen to include improvements to ventilation, application of bioside paint and other health and safety matters. In addition, the following schemes are under consideration a new canteen, fire risk and emergency lighting works, and home economics accommodation. Uh, in addition, under the school enhancement programme, St. Louis Grammar School Balamina has applied for the refurbishment and extension of the existing convent building to provide a creative and expressive arts facility, including music, drama, art, and moving images and media studies. The scheme is currently in the economic appraisal stage, and no decision has been taken regarding funding. Question 15 has been withdrawn as well. Dahi Mackay, Mr Mackay. Can I, can, can I start by thanking the Minister for recently accompanying me to uh, St Louis uh, Grammar School in, in Balamina? Uh, can I ask the Minister further to his answer? Uh, could he indicate when uh, an announcement on the school enhancement programme uh, will take place? And can he indicate uh, whether or not St Louis Grammar in Balamina uh, will be included? Uh, I hope to be in a position in the next number of weeks to make a, a public announcement in relation to all the, uh, the schemes underneath the school enhancement programme. I think there was 51 in total, uh, and I hope to be in a position to make an announcement in, in the very near future. Uh, I can't be specific in relation to Balamina, uh, but I can assure the member that we are progressing matters as quickly as possible. Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, in view of the fact that uh, what the Minister has had to refer to manifests a growth demand in respect of that particular grammar school. Does he acknowledge that his assault on grammar schools and his attempt to put down such schools and the attempt to destroy such an offering of education is one that is flying in the face of parental demand which manifests itself through ultimate in the need for more buildings at such grammar schools? Um, well, the, the member perhaps do a little bit more research before standing up and picking a question off the top of his head. I actually have approved an additional grammar school this morning. New grammar school in Lurgan. Voluntary grammar school, non-selective. Because the title of grammar has actually nothing to do with selective education. A grammar school is a management type of school that can charge fees to its pupils and parents, though there is no legal obligation upon the pupils and parents to pay the fees. In relation to the accommodation at St Louis, it is replacement accommodation uh, in, in relation to the school because the accommodation uh, which is being replaced is not fit for purpose and I don't believe that any child should be taught within it. And that's, that's the programme of work at play. I also understand that within the Balamina area there are proposals being discussed in relation to how we move forward, particularly in the Catholic sector. Uh, to a system which meets the needs of all the pupils within that sector, and I await the outcome of those discussions. Mr. Story. Mr. Story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Following on from the Minister's comment in relation to those uh, discussions, what implication will there be in relation to the proposals in relation to the amalgamation of St. Louis, St. Benedict's, and St. Paul's to any proposals that he is making, whether under announcements to come? And what discussions have those three schools had? to ensure that there is a maximum benefit and given the fact that there is concern of the long-term long future provision of grammar school provision within the maintained sector in Balamina? Um, again, it depends on what the member defines as grammar school uh, provision going into the future. I will not repeat the comments I made to Mr Allister, but you, you know fine well in terms of what grammar school provision means. I am not privy to all the discussions between the three schools, uh, but I can assure the member that any expenditure planned by my department will take into account uh, future plans on the way forward and ensuring that whatever investment we make, uh, particularly in capital infrastructure, will be there to serve the community going into the future. I want to just say to the House, this is really a constituency issue. This is why I am keen to get in constituency members. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, when we're talking about the planned development of schools in Balamina, could I ask the Minister for an update in Castle Tower? 
Um, I, I don't have the full details in front of me. This is turning into topical questions. Uh, I don't have the full details in front of me in relation to Castle Tower, but my last discussions uh, with officials, it was uh, clear that it is progressing well and that discussions moving towards uh, building programmes around that school are moving in the right direction. Ian Millen. Mr. Millen. Uh, question number three. Question number three. I set up an Irish Medium Post Primary Advisory Group to look in detail at how to deliver viable and sustainable Irish Medium Post Primary education that is high quality, meets the needs of the pupils, and commands the confidence of parents. I understand that work is progressing well and that the advisory group has met on 14 occasions since last August. They have met with key stakeholders from the sector, including school governors, principals, teachers, and other educationists and Irish medium cultural and linguistic specialists. I am also pleased to report that they have sought the views of parents in preschool and primary schools through a questionnaire. They have also gathered evidence from the neighbouring jurisdiction of Scotland, Wales and the South of Ireland. And I expect the advisory group to submit their final report and recommendations to me in the coming weeks. Good day, Ken Collier. I was my weakest on era. Could you show? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Could I ask the Minister to comment on the requirements which the statutory duty to facilitate Irish medium education places on his department? Um, my department takes its statutory duties to encourage and facilitate the development of Irish medium education very seriously, and will continue to do so. One of the main ways in which the Department discharges its statutory duty is through the Irish Medium Education Review. The ongoing implementation of the recommendations of the review continues to contri contribute greatly to the vibrancy and success of the Irish medium sector. While significant progress has been made, I am keen to identify where more needs to be done to develop this important area further and to ensure that the education in this sector is of the highest quality. Gregory Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, given the relatively small number of pupils who attend uh, post-primary uh, Irish medium schools, will the Minister be mindful of relativity, proportionateness and equity whenever he's looking at capital investment in controlled schools compared to Irish medium schools? Um, I, I am confident that I can stand over uh, my previous two uh, announcements in relation to capital build, and I have ensured that every sector is treated uh, on the basis of equality, that every sector has been given the, re the resources that I have to deliver, and I, I have uh, significantly reduced resources in terms of capital as a result directly from Westminster. But I can assure the member I will continue to deliver my functions on the basis of the legislation which governs my functions, including equality and my uh, legal duty to, to encourage and facilitate Irish medium education. Patrick McLuhan. Mr. McLuhan. Uh, Year one um, could I ask that the Minister give some indication as to what extent the development of Irish medium education is being encouraged through the establishment of units and streams in our post-primary schools? It's, we have a significant number of uh, post-primary Irish medium units throughout uh, the North. Uh, and it's up to schools at the end of the day and the sector to develop these. It's not a role for the department to establish any school uh, in any sector. But we have a significant number of units, uh, both in primary and post-primary. These are very successful. They are providing uh, good education through the medium of Irish to the young people involved in them. And it is hoped in a number of those places that they will grow to such numbers where you will have a standalone, fully immersion. Uh, Irish medium sector, but it is one way of growing the Irish medium sector, uh, and it's a way which I will continue to support going into the future. Ian McCarthy, Mr. McCarthy. Much, Mr. Speaker, could the Minister tell the Assembly why he has a special advisory group on Irish medium schools? And there's nothing wrong with that, but he doesn't have a similar one for uh, integrated education. Um, the reason why, have, and this is on the Pacific area of Irish medium education, as in relation to the provision of post-primary. Uh, there has been a failure over a number of years to develop post-primary provision, particularly in the Derry City South Derry area, and I have asked this group <coughs> excuse me, 
to look at that area specifically. Uh, the member will be aware that we have a significant number of uh, post-primary integrated schools scattered uh, across the north. And there, we do, as we do indeed in terms of the Irish medium sector, support uh, groups to facilitate and promote integrated education as well. But this is set up specifically to look at the challenges in relation to teaching through a second language. I await the, the, the outcome of the report. If the member believes or there's a, a lobby believes that I should set up a, another body to look at the challenges faced by the integrated sector in establishing more primary schools, I'm more than happy to look at that. Chris Hazard. Mr. Cahar, let a whole question four, please. Uh, I announced a new bill for Dromore Central Primary School in June 2012 and an economic appraisal for the new school at a cost of £10.8 million was approved on the 23rd of May 13. The new school is to be said at Mossfield Road. It is for a 20 class based school to accommodate a projected long term enrolment of 730 pupils. The new school will also have a further two special needs rooms. The design and construction have advanced, and on the 11th of September 2013, an invitation to tender was issued. Unfortunately, following the tender evaluation, the preferred bidder withdrew. The tender assessment for Dermore PS has been rerun, and a new contractor, Tracy Brothers, has been appointed. All parties are working towards the project being on site by the end of March or early April of this year. Chris Hazard. Come on, uh, can call you and, I, and did I thank the Minister for con confirming the construction is going to start in the near future today. Uh, can the Minister outline indeed if there, there's been a successful conclusion around various other site issues uh, attached to this project? Um, th this particular build programme has proven to be quite challenging. Uh, and I note Mr Campbell's interest in the control sector is that much that he's leaving the room as we discuss a control sector school, uh, which suggests that maybe his interest wasn't that keen. Uh, so in relation to this site, uh, the site of the new school has presented a number of difficulties and challenges, including contaminated ground at the front of the site, underlying peat, the need to culvert an existing stream, the need for a pumping station due to the site topography. Uh, this has resulted in above the normal costs for external works associated with the site, including playing fields, flood av uh, alleviation works, and remedial treatment for the contaminated land. All these issues have been taken into account and now form part of the design work. And as I say, I, I hope the contractors are on site by the end of this month, but certainly in April. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the fact that the Minister is continuing to go ahead with this project of a new primary school in Dremore. As the Minister well knows, it has uh, been ongoing for the past almost 15 years now, and the existing school is bursting at the seams. Can the Minister comment on the fact that the Southern Board underestimated the difficulties of the site that was proposed here? And can he give this House an assurance that the new contractors will continue with this project despite the difficulties with the site? Um, well, I, I can't give specific comments in relation to the challenges faced by the site. I understand that the, the, the initial tender uh, had underestimated some of the construction required on the site, and hence the reason why they withdrew their tender. But I'm glad to say that that only gave a, a, a small delay to this, the project going on site. Um, the building programmes can prove to be very uh, difficult. You come across issues in terms of site examinations that perhaps you would have estimated in your initial appraisal of the area, etc., etc., and this site has proved to be quite challenging. Uh, but I'm glad to say that we are now have crossed all the hurdles. We just need to get the contractors on site now and start the school being built. And whatever lessons have to be learned from this project should be learned to ensure that the next project we move to is put on site even quicker. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Question five. Uh, I fully recognise that parental involvement in children's learning is a key factor in improving children's academic attainment and achievements, as well as their overall behaviour and attendance. This is reflected in the Department's Guide for the Board of Governors, which highlights the important role which governors have in ensuring that schools engage, in parents, their children's, engage parents in their children's education and in the work of the school. My department has in place and will continue to implement various interventions to support parents to be actively involved in all aspects of their children's education. This includes £2 million this year and in 2014 for a community education initiative programme. This supports parents in communities with high levels of educational deprivation to get their children ready for school and support them through all phases of their education. 
Additional annual funding of 1.2 million through the Extended Schools Initiative for programmes to involve parents in their children's learning and in school life. An expansion of the Sure Start programme from the top 20% to the top 25% most disadvantaged wards to enable many more parents to become actively involved in their children's educational, health and social development. I have also allocated £24.8 million in 13-14 and £25.7 million in 14-15 for the programme uh, as well. Um, I also have in relation to the nurture units, uh, which have been recently launched of uh, 420,000 this year and 480,000 next year for 10 nurture units. Proposals within the SEND framework also examine this matter, and there is a range of programmes and initiatives outlined will directly support parents to become and remain actively involved in their child's education. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. <coughs> While I'm cash to curler a div a party not will she or gumma saku frasta learn skull uh ugs or while captain a uh aisle if three chin chorus fisha ta on. Um thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Um could I ask the Minister what progress is being made in respect of the demands of some parents uh, whose children are confined to home and unable to attend school. Can I ask them what progress has been made uh, with regard to negotiations with the trade unions to ensure uh, that distance learning can be engaged in in their homes by those children? Uh, um, the, I have established a, a working group consisting of the unions and the management side to overcome whatever difficulties or perceived difficulties there may be with some of the unions in relation to particularly Illuminate uh, in relation to this matter. Uh, I believe Illuminate is a very good resource. It is there to meet the needs of, of the children who for whatever reason cannot attend school and wish to be kept up with their education and indeed have a legal entitlement to be kept up to date uh, with their education. I don't want to go into the detail of the discussions because I believe they're at a sensitive juncture at this time and we are close to agreement on the matter. And I wish those discussions well, and I hope they come to a speedy resolution to ensure that the young people who require those services receive those services in the future. Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, involving uh, parents uh, in children's education is obviously vitally important. When will the Minister allow the parents of the Newton Breda and Knock Breda pupils to become involved in their children's education via the Southeastern Education and Library Board through the appointment of public representatives and political representatives to the board? Um, well, this falls into the old equation of when will or if ESA ever happens. Um, I, I have, was set a programme for government target uh, by the executive to establish ESA. I have done everything within my power to establish it, but yet ESA remains elusive as ever. There are some comments coming from Mr. Story, which I can't make out, but I assume they're not supportive of ESA. So, does the member want to be a member or, or appoint councillors to the South Eastern Education Library Board? Well, what shape will the South Eastern Education Library Board be after uh, RPA and the councils? There's another large chunk of work in the absence of ESA that the department has to take on. So, before I decide to reconstitute the South Eastern Education and Library Board. I'm going to have to work out what boundaries the South Eastern Education and Library Board will have, along with all the other boards. Then, if we move towards the appointment of councillors, we appoint the councillors. But the councillors that would be appointed in those circumstances are there to be leaders, not followers. Sandra Oberend. Mrs. Oberend. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Parents and guardians are the the single biggest influencing factor on a child's life. Does the minister accept that many parents who do not place a high value on schooling had such a poor experience of education themselves that they simply cannot bring themselves to engage with the educational establishment again? What is the department uh, especially going to do to outreach to this group? Um, the pieces of work which I read out in response to the original question to Mr. Bradley, many of them are targeting hard to reach uh, parents and communities in relation to education, and your members uh, is correct in many ways. Where you have most difficulties in terms of education from parents is parents who had a poor educational experience themselves and therefore do not value education. I have launched a, a public advertisement campaign 
to encourage all parents to become involved in their children's education, to make society realise, or to, in, in terms of broader society, that education does not begin and end at the school gates, that despite the, the, the highly qualified, highly motivated teaching staff and school staff we have, unless parents and communities are involved in their children's education, it will not succeed. So that is uh, an important message which I have been issuing over this last year and, or two years. I hope to expand that message further and also through the programmes of work which I read out to Mr Bradley to directly contact uh, parents and families who, for whatever reason, do not understand the, the, the need and the benefits of a good education for their child. Lord McEvitt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question 6. I am aware of the health and well-being issues faced by our teachers in our schools today and the importance of addressing them if we are to retain, retain a committed, motivated and healthy teaching workforce. In 2011, a strategy for teacher health and well-being was agreed between management and teacher sides of the Teachers' Negotiating Committee. This strategy aims to create a culture throughout the education sector that openly values teachers, promotes their health and well-being and reduces, where practicable, the potential for work-related stress. A number of initiatives, agreements and services have been introduced to help support the strategy, including a range of schemes to improve the flexibility of teachers' working patterns, a 24-hour confidential telephone counselling service, and new policy statements on measures to combat bullying and harassment and violence and abusive behaviour against teachers, as well as a revised workload agreement. My department, together with employing authorities and the teachers' unions, continue to actively consider health and wellbeing issues through the Teachers Negotiating Committee joint working parties. Most recently, my department, in conjunction with the employing authorities, has developed a regional strategy for the management and promotion of teacher attendance. The purpose of the strategy is to bring consistency of approach to how teachers' attendance is managed by employers across the education sector. It is intended to help employers monitor, control and improve attendance levels by complementing existing policies and procedures I intend to publish this strategy later this month. Ms. McKevin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm delighted that the Minister has acknowledged in, in his answer the bullying that can go on um, in some schools. Um, but having said that, can I ask the Minister has he any plans to introduce a mentor system for all newly appointed principals? Um, as part of uh, teaching or the qualification for headship, there is a uh, networking of trainee heads and also a combination of that and training with appointed heads in, in schools, particularly schools outside your normal sector. So that, that's part of it. But part of the mentor system, I understand that a, a system currently operates where uh, a board of governors or a managing authority can appoint a mentor to a newly appointed head if they believe it is beneficial to the newly appointed head. And I believe it, it, it can be of great benefit because taking on a headship or a leadership role can be quite challenging for the first period of time, and it is very useful to be able to contact someone who you trust and ask them for advice in these matters. Trevor Lund. Mr. Lund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question seven. Uh, the education bill cannot be advanced to consideration stage without the agreement of the executive. This remains outstanding. In seeking to reach an accommodation, I have proposed a number of amendments, in particular measures that will retain and develop school autonomy in employment matters. Without agreement, however, I must, not, I must soon commit to and invest in an alternative future. In particular, local government reform may force the issue, as I must have in place by April 2015. Sorry. New legislation supporting a reconfiguration of Education and Library Board territory simply to align with local government reform. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. He would be aware, I think, that the Governing Bodies Association decision has come as something of a surprise after years of opposition. Can he assure us that it hasn't come about as a result of a deal that we're yet to be made aware of between the major parties, which may or may not be to the detriment of our children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can assure the member from the outset that I would not enter into any deal which would be to the detriment of our children. The only agreements I will enter into, which ones which I believe are, uh, help improve the educational outcomes of our young people, are do not uh, act in a way which is a detriment to our children. I welcome the fact that the Governing Bodies Association have stepped forward and said they can move forward with ESA. 
Uh, that followed discussions with the governing bodies' associations and an outlining of them to me of what their concerns were. I have made a significant compromise in regards to this matter. I had to think long and hard about it, but I believe I have not compromised the principles of the Bill, nor have I compromised the principle which the Member refers to. And as we are often told, in a coalition government or executive, you have to compromise to reach agreement. I have compromised and I have not reached any agreement. Mervyn Storey. Mr. Storey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Despite the comments in the House today, it's at variance with what the Minister, through his permanent secretary, conveyed to into the party at their conference on Friday, where basically he was drawing a line under ESA and was telling the delegates at that conference that they'd have to move on. However, what can the Minister tell this House today, despite uh, yet again, letters appearing in the public domain from one element of the educational sector that the control sector, despite the fact that it has lost Can its I funding, now the member should finish. It has lost its funding as of the 31st of December. It has no representation in the area planning steering group, and the control sector remains still unsatisfied. How is he going to meet their needs? Well, you see, this is where we come into political debate and discussion. I resolve one issue, a long outstanding issue, the issue I am told is the issue, and it has to be resolved. I resolve it, and the ink is no not hardly dry on the paper until the door opens and another issue is set on my desk. Now, to me, that is a party or individuals acting in very, very bad faith, and I cannot negotiate that way, and I will not negotiate that way. Sorry, well. Uh, I have, as is necessary, as is necessary, made significant changes to ESA over a period of time. Over a period of time. I agree to the Heads of Agreement published in November 2011 and the issue which the member refers to was not in the Heads of Agreement published in November 2011. So therefore, when did it become an issue? When did it become a sticking point in ESA? It became a sticking point in ESA after I removed the previous obstacle. After I removed the concerns about the Governing Bodies Association, all of a sudden, individuals or parties or a collection of both came forward with another issue. And that tells me one thing. They do not want to, under any circumstances, bring forward legislation to this House entitled ESA. Rodwin McGahan. Uh, can the Minister remind the Chamber of the importance of securing agreement on ESA, both in terms of savings to the public purse and the educational well-being of our young people? ESA was initially brought forward as a method to improve the educational outcomes for our young people. Second to that, it was to modernise the, the management layers uh, within our society. Uh, and therefore to make savings as well. It's estimated that we could have saved around £20 million per annum if we had had the political will to move forward. Um, that political will apparently doesn't exist. We are now facing the scenario that with the review of public administration in councils, with councils moving to their new numbers and the reconfigure of councils, the education and library boards have to be reconfigured to meet those boundaries. That's a significant piece of work my department will have to undertake. There will have to be consultation, there will have to be legislation drew up as well. And there may well be financial consequences for the Department of Education. If there is financial consequences for the Department of Education as a result of ESA not going through and I having to bring forward legislation and redrafting and redrawing uh, the boundaries around the, around the education and library boards, I will be going to the executive and pointing out to the executive that it is not I who have incurred this cost, but it is a political failure of certain parties around the executive have incurred this uh, cost, and I expect the executive to cough up for it. Matt Ramsey. I thank the Minister for his, for his responses to date. Would the Minister accept that, certainly in the Western Education Library Board area, there is a level of low morale and uncertainty and surrounding the introduction of ESA? And does the Minister agree with me that the delay in bringing ESA to the floor has left boards in a position, education boards across Northern Ireland, uh, not being able to deliver development programme training for those same teachers? Um, I, I accept, and in a recent meeting with the Association of Education and Library Boards, I accepted the point that they made that morale is low within our education and library boards, that staff have been messed about for far too long. 
I have agreed to deal with vacancy control and I have received a paper from the association and we are currently going to have discussions with the association on the best way to move that paper forward. But one of the reasons I, I come to the conclusion that a compromise was required is because I know our current structures can't deliver education in, in the manner in which we want it to be delivered. I know the personnel working in education and the education library boards are not happy about how the services are being delivered on the ground uh, currently. That's why I come forward and said this can no longer continue. I am prepared to remove the obstacle uh, which everyone told me was the issue that needed to be dealt with and it couldn't go anywhere else. And as I have said, the ink wasn't dry on the document until a new matter was put in front of my desk and says we can't move until that's dealt with. That concludes all questions to the Minister of Education. We now move to topical questions and I call William Humphrey. Mr Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the Shankill Manifesto for Education, which was presented to him by my colleague Nigel Dodds, MP, the Member of Parliament for North Belfast and the Greater Shankill uh, Partnership? Um, the elements of, of the Shankill Manifesto for Education, uh, the most specific element which relates to my department where to go next is as to whether to call an education action zone. And I am uh, close to making a final decision in relation to that matter. But regardless of what decision I make in relation to that matter, the Education Minister declaring Shankill an Education Action Zone will be meaningless unless there is a recognition in certain schools in the area, in boards of governors in the area, in senior management teams in schools in the area, that they have a responsibility to play in the educational well-being of the young people in that area. And indeed, there are schools in the area who are showing the way it should be done are showing the way that education can be delivered in, in very difficult circumstances at time, with challenges at time, uh, etc. So I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm bringing my deliberations to an end in relation to the Schenkel Action Zone, but the, regardless of my decision, responsibility has to be taken on board locally and the recognition that there is no excuse for children failing within education. That Every opportunity has to be taken within the schools, within the classrooms, within the community to ensure, and it goes back to earlier questions about supporting families as well, that every opportunity is taken to ensure that that young, people, that young person's uh, opportunities are, are given to them at the earliest stage in their education. William Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I agree with the Minister, as someone who is a governor in two primary schools in the Greater Shankill area. I agree entirely that there is a tremendous onus on the governors, on principals, and management teams uh, to, to show leadership. And I think many of the schools, if not all of the schools, have been doing that. And certainly, I think there is a, a vast improvement in many of them. I, I appreciate the willingness that the Minister has talked about here today uh, about the establishment of, of an action zone. Can I ask the Minister, has he got a timescale in mind for when his announcement might come? Um, I, I don't have an exact time team in front of me, but we're talking weeks rather than months. Kahlo Hoshi. Mr. Hoshi. Uh, Gormel, Coyle, could I ask the Minister to detail his current capital plans, including new builds and the school enhancements programme? Gormel. Uh, I've made a number of capital statements in recent time. In, in 25th of June 2012, I announced that 18 schools excuse me, will receive facility support of £173 million investment in the schools of state. Of the 18, three projects have started construction on site, with a further five expected to be on site by the end of April 2014. In my capital announcement on the 22nd of January 2013, 22 school projects are to be advanced in planning, representing a further investment of £220 million. The majority of these projects are in early stage in planning and principally development proposals or economic appraisal stage. Going based on IRA. Uh, given the recent job losses, particularly including in my own constituency, uh, does the Minister realise the boost that this investment gives to the entire economy across the board? I go and break isolation while I ask the case. Yes, without doubt. Um, and my, my primary uh, responsibility, obviously, is, is to provide good educational facilities to our young people. I'm also conscious that any announcement I make in relation to capital also benefits our wider economy. And indeed, I was conscious after uh, the, the, there was an emergency executive meeting called after uh, Wilson's in Lorne. I think it's Wilson's in Lorne. Lost a significant number of staff at that time. Uh, and both the First and Deputy First Minister tasked all ministers to go away and to look at their budgets as to how they could support the economy. And I, I would hope that through the investments we have made 
and are making through the school building programme that we are investing in our economy, and also through programmes such as the Minor Works programme and indeed the, the, the School Enhancement programme, which, when finalised, will inject tens of millions of pounds uh, into building programmes. Thank you. George Robinson. Mr. Speaker, I could ask the Minister when he will make an announcement regarding the common funding for formula. Uh, the, the member will appreciate that the deliberations around 15,000 consultation responses has taken longer than I would have expected. I hope to be in a position in the next week or so to inform the education and library boards of the outcome of the education of the common funding formula and then inform the schools of their budgets for the year ahead. As I previously stated, while there will be significant changes to the common funding formula and that the principle of targeting social need will be enshrined within it, no school will lose funding as a result of my changes. George Robinson. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, in light of the rejection of the Department's consultation on the formula, how will I be confident that the new proposals will have the support of schools and parents? Uh, the, I've said in this House several occasions the purpose of a consultation is not a ballot. We are elected to make decisions. We have a duty to consult, and I take my duties very seriously in relation to the consultation. Indeed, I have taken a considerable amount of time to study the consultation responses. While there are differing views in relation to the consultation response, the principle of targeting social need was accepted by many, uh, and I intend to move forward on that basis. Dolores Kelly. Mrs Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. M uh, Minister, if I can uh, tease out uh, some of your thinking a bit further in relation to the changes. Uh, I understand, Minister, that schools who, as you will appreciate, have to plan more than one year ahead have been told that they have to operate within a 5% of their budget, uh, and any school uh, that has any excess will lose that funding in subsequent years. Is that a fact? Uh, it's a fact, but it's not a fact as a result of my changes to the common funding formula. That has been in place now for several years, perhaps maybe a decade or so, when changes to LMS were introduced. So schools do have to plan within 5% either way of their budget. I think it's good financial planning. The member will be interested to know that currently in surpluses, there's somewhere in the region of £40 million of surpluses out there in the education sector. I believe that money would be best spent in schools at this time. Uh, but of course, each school is monitored as to why it's holding a surplus. It has to provide explanations to its managing authority. And where those explanations tally, then it's perfectly reasonable for the school to be holding a surplus. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, Minister, given the change in demographics, how, how uh, are, uh, is the department marrying the information that is available to schools in terms of the number of entrants anticipated over the next two to five years? Uh, and how is that married against the funding availability uh, to those schools, available to the schools? One of the issues that has been causing us... Uh, uh, some thinking within the department in relation as to how we move forward with common funding formula is this. Next year we will have 3,500 more pupils in primary school than we did the previous year. There is a significant number of newcomer children among those and a significant number of children claiming free school needs entitlement. In our post-primary sector we will be losing 1,700 pupils next year. There will be 1,700 less pupils next year than in the previous year. These figures I haven't said, do not come as a shock to us. They have been monitored over a period of time, and we expect to see a continuing rise uh, in, in school numbers up towards 2017. But they have to be taken into account when I'm deliberating in relation to the common funding formula and how best to use the resources available to me. Chris Hazard. Chris Hazard. Can, call you. Um, can I ask the Minister to comment perhaps on the, the current potential uh, of establishing Irish medium post primary provision in the city of Derry? I have, uh, as I said in, in questions earlier, established a review group to establish how we provide Irish medium post-primary in Derry and South Derry. And it's not simply a case of establishing a school. We need to establish a school which has the confidence of parents, which is sustainable moving forward and provides high-quality education through the medium of Irish. And that's the challenge I have set the review group. Chris Hazard. <coughs> I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister to outline uh, what are the potential time frames once the need for Irish medium provision has been established? Gordon Muggett. Well, I, I hope that the final draft of the report will be with me in the next number of weeks. I want to take a time to cons consider the report and the options on the way forward. And then um, I will share that report with the managing authorities to see as to how they can enact the report in the sense of bringing forward development proposals if need be in relation to the provision of 
a standalone school, a unit, whatever it may be, uh, going into the future. I don't want to reach conclusions, obviously, ahead of reading the report, but I want to ensure that whatever decision we come to, that we can be assured that parents will have confidence in it, that the young people will be receiving high-quality education through the medium of Irish. Alec Eaton. Thank you. Uh, could I ask the Minister what directions or guidelines are coming from his department down to the boards for youth club provision for children with special needs? Um, I don't have the full details in front of me, but I'm happy to share them with the member. But we do uh, have equality obligations placed upon me as Minister Department and therefore uh, the service providers through the boards. Will. Any provision has to be accessible and equitable provision to all our young people. Um, maybe the Minister is not aware, but uh, a situation in my own constituency at Ballymagee Primary School, um, the South Eastern Education Library Board have denied access to some children with special needs because there has been a change in the age criteria. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that it is unacceptable to change the age criteria without consultation with the parents in the first place? Um, uh, the member will understand that I do not have the full specifics in front of me, but if he wishes to be in correspondence with me on the matter, or discuss the matter with me further, I'd be happy to follow it up with him. Mr. McMullen. Mr. McMullen. Can I ask the Minister to detail what steps his department has taken to address issues around school absenteeism, uh, which has been reported in the recent report of the Audit Office? Uh, in relation to the Audit Office report, I have to give the Public Accounts Committee its place and allow the Public Accounts Committee to study uh, the report in detail. It would be improper of me to respond ahead of that, and as a previous chair of the Public Accounts Committee, I don't want to uh, do that either. But I have to, the, the, the Department does have uh, measures in place ensuring that children can and should attend school. And in relation to earlier conversations and questions, it's vitally important that if a child is to reach its educational potential, it has to do that by attending school first and foremost. Uh, so there's a responsibility of parents. Under Article 45 of the Education Libraries Board, uh, parents and guardians have a legal responsibility to ensure their children uh, attend school. It's also important that we encourage parents to do so and acknowledge why it is important to do so. Uh, my department has a devaluing education campaign, Attendance Matters, a, a, a policy document on how and why uh, and what circumstances support and actions can be taken, and also obviously the work of the Education and Welfare Service as well. Can I thank the Minister for his, for his, for his answers? Would the Minister tell me, would the establishment of a, of a single uh, educational skills authority uh, help to address these issues? Well, it would certainly ensure that there is a. Certainly, not, it would certainly ensure there is no postcode lottery, in the sense, in that all areas are tackling the problem in the same way and a centralised support for supporting it uh, in the same way and learning uh, across the board. Uh, the truth of the matter is. Our education and library boards, despite heroic efforts uh, over many years, are no longer fit for purpose. That's just the bottom line. And those who fail to recognise that need to come forward with an alternative. They need to come forward and say, well, we reject ESA. But we've taken you 10 years to tell you we've rejected ESA. We've agreed with putting it into two programmes for government. But we've finally realised we're rejected. Here's an alternative. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. When I get to call you, um, I think it was last year the Minister very kindly at my invitation visited St Joseph's High School in Cross McGlen and saw the need there for uh, a new capital project. Can, the, can I ask the Minister if he can report uh, any progress with regard to that particular school? Um, I am currently examining proposals from all the managing authorities in relation to new bills. Uh, I am not in a position to indicate or announce what those new bills will be at this time, but uh, all, the, all the managing authorities, including CCMS, were asked for their priority bill programme. Uh, one of the areas in, in, in South Armagh and Uri which has to be finalised is area planning, and I would encourage the member himself uh, to ensure that the allure of the bright lights of the grammar schools in Uri are dimmed somewhat. Uh, to ensure that everyone is playing on a level playing field and that St Joseph's, which is a fine educational establishment, is allowed to attract the number of pupils required to move forward to ensure that we have a new build and future generations of education taking part in that school. Dominic Brown. 
Thank the Minister for his answer. And the Minister will be aware that uh, area planning uh, with regard to South Armagh uh, is uh, all, all but finalised, if not finalised. Um, would he agree with me that after visiting the school that there is a pressing need for a new capital project in St Joseph's and Cross McGlen? Um, there, there are many schools across the board which require new builds. I'm not arguing that St Joseph's or indeed many other schools require a new build. But the question I have to ask is when and how do I replace them and in terms of our priorities around replacing new builds and new schools. And that's, that's the challenges I face with a very limited capital budget. But schools should also be conscious that if I do make an announcement in the near future around capital programme and they're not on it, that's not the end of the story. We are now involved in a rolling programme of capital bills and there will be a number of announcements in the years ahead about capital bills uh, as long as we can ensure that the budgets uh, allow us to do so. Um, but uh, as the member says, if area planning in the South Armour area is near to be finalised, it has to be finalised along with Newry. And I, again, I say to the member to take up the challenge of standing up to the grammars in Newry and saying that there is a fine educational establishment sitting in Cross McGlean which can provide excellent education to the young people of the area. Order members, that concludes question time.